Welcome to our annual forum, everyone. This is the year-end celebration, so thanks for taking the time to join us today. My name is Michael Pagel, the Program Manager of Greening Healthcare. And with this being a forum event, there are two parts to today's webinar. Part one starts now and includes our keynote executive panel and also a review of the top saving hospitals over the five years, uh, some of which have achieved over 20% savings in the last 12 months compared to five years ago. Part two is an in-depth a uh, case study of Humber River Hospital, and that hospital will actually be sort of a, a central theme to both parts today, and you'll learn a bit more of why they're uh, almost become the, the celebrity of, uh, of low emissions uh, of our group now. Uh, and we'll round out with a panel discussion on how to move forward with net zero emissions. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button. We'll try to incorporate as many as we can. And if we can't, uh, we'll definitely follow up after the webinar is over. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted at the end of the week to greeninghc.com. If you can't find the event page, just email any of the Greening Healthcare group and we can point you towards that. And a special thanks as always to our program sponsors for making these events happen, Enbridge Gas and Thermogenic Spoilers. Thanks to both of you. And Greening Healthcare is run under the nonprofit organization of Climate Challenge Network. And I now welcome Ian Jarvis, the executive director of the Climate Challenge Network, to get us started today. You go ahead. Michael, and uh, we've got folks today from across North America, West Coast to the East Coast, and from the UK. So I'm not going to say good morning. I think we'll revert to the usual Australian. Happiness of good day. So uh, again, welcome here. Uh, uh, we begin, uh, even though this is a virtual platform that we're working on, that getting transmitted to uh, uh, to multiple uh, locations. Uh, we always acknowledge the indigenous people of all the lands that each of us in North America calls home, uh, from coast to coast to coast in North America, because all three coasts are. Uh, are definitely involved. We acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of the Inuit, the Métis, and the First Nations people that share these lands with us. I am uh, personally today speaking from the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the uh, Credit River. And again, we want to acknowledge that we honor the, their heritage and we seek to along with them to protect and preserve the lands that we occupy together. Let me step along to the agenda for this morning. So part one, um, welcome and introductions. I just got a little more to add to this. Uh, the keynote and executive panel, we are thrilled with the, uh, the, the diversity and the depth of the people who've been willing to take time out of their crazy busy schedules to join us this morning. and. Uh, and share their insights and perspectives on our common challenge and our common opportunities. So uh, beginning with Bob Collins uh, uh, delivering our keynote today, she will be joining our executive panel uh, to talk about essentially what's working, what can we build upon, what are the challenges, what are the drivers of change that we're seeing both uh, in Canada and North America and around the world today. And because it's a year-end celebration, we want to celebrate some successes. So we, Michael's looked back over five years of greening healthcare members. And as he mentioned, siphoned out those hospitals that have gone above and beyond and done extraordinary things. So we, as a program, always recognize success, but more importantly, we build upon success. So all of them, and we'll share a high level, all of them have lessons that all of us can, uh, can, can choose from and apply in our own day-to-day -day work to, again, deal with uh, our common concerns around uh, dealing with climate change, dealing with energy efficiency, dealing with ever escalating utility costs. So this is where we wanna go with part one to this morning. Uh, the welcome and introductions falls to me. Uh, that is me in happier times wearing a collar and tie. I, I'm not even sure I know where that tie is anymore, but we'll figure that out as we get back to some kind of normal and, 2022. Uh, but let's begin with governance, because within nations, within provinces, states, and counties, uh, uh, within local government, and within individual organizations, 
the, the message, the prioritization of, uh, of climate change has to come from the top. They set the stage, they set the rules. And once again, uh, the world has been generous with us in conducting COP just in advance of this annual forum. So COP26, as I'm sure you all know, just happened in Glasgow. Uh, here are some cameos from, uh, from what arose there. And nobody was saying uh, climate change is not real. Nobody was saying that we don't have to uh, deal with it. Some were raising their targets that they'd set. You see on the left-hand side there, Mayor Tory of Toronto, uh, speaking to the acceleration of the net zero goal for the city from 2050 to 2040. So the, the world we have right now is leaders that are uh, recognizing the evidence, responding to the science and setting ever increasing targets, um, but struggling to change the trajectory. The, 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 we're still going in the wrong direction. We're not on track for any of these targets that have been set so far, but we can assume one that the, the, the world is agreeing maybe not every individual, but the world is agreeing that climate change, the climate crisis is real. Um, and we can expect that to be reflected increasingly over the next 20 and 30, 10, actually because 20, 30 targets are the first ones, over the next 10, 20 and 30 years, both in incentives for us to lower greenhouse gas emissions, but also in regulations. And we'll hear a bit from, from Mike Rohan later, uh, He'll touch, I'm sure, on the executive panel on, uh, sorry, on the net zero session this afternoon on what New York City is doing with carbon caps. So our world for the next 10, 20, 30 years is going to be one of incentives and regulations aimed to nudge us in the direction of deep reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And it's fair to say it will affect all of us, every organization, every individual, what we buy, how we travel, how we work, how we make decisions. All of that is going to be subject to this new lens. Healthcare has always been seen through the lens of, uh, of economics, of finance, of, of money. It's been seen through health outcomes. Uh, now it is increasingly being seen through the lens of sustainability. So if governance is essential, our belief is in how Climate Challenge Network is working with different building sectors, is that the, the results are going to come from the grassroots level, from the ground. Um, so individual organizations responding to what world leaders are telling us are taking it upon themselves to go above and beyond. And we're gonna hear a lot today about what above and beyond looks like, how challenging that is, and hopefully how rewarding that is. Because again, my prediction would be everybody on this call today is going to be facing this, is gonna be seeing significant change in what they do and how they do it in response to why we need to address the climate change issue. So within every organization, we go from governance to on the ground decision-making and there are new demands, new responsibilities on top of COVID and on top of all the other things that everybody's having to deal with right now. It's a time of multiple crises, uh, but the climate one is not going away. The second fundamental belief that you'll see reflected throughout the forum today is that the future begins here today with current success stories, with things that are going really well right now that we can learn from, we can build upon, and we can work our way towards this notion of, uh, not notion, this uh, imperative of, uh, of deep reductions in carbon by 2030 and net zero by 2040 or 2050, depending on wherever we are. So, um, every organization is affected and the practical pathway to low carbon to net zero begins with the best of what we have today. Today, we're going to hear from leaders about what that governance story looks like. And we're going to hear a lot about current best practices that we build upon as we uh, move collectively in scale towards the low carbon future. So let's start. We, we could not ask for a better keynote than, than Bob Collins. I, I'm not going to reread uh, the bios that everybody's seen and the material that's gone out already, but uh, Bob was both uh, leading the development of what is in the top handful of the most energy efficient hospitals in the world right now, uh, and now as CEO of, CEO of Humber River is making sure that that story continues. And generously this morning, 
uh, coming forward to share the, the key parameters, like how, uh, how the accomplishment of the Humber River Hospital, which we'll show in more detail later in the day, how that came into being and how uh, Humber River and other hospitals can build upon that success. So Bob, I will be your, uh, your slide advancer, if you could just tell me as we step our way forward and, uh, and over to you. Thank you, and Ian and Michael will tell you that, of course, I always want to tell the story about the project, but they remind me they're telling that later today, and I'm supposed to focus on how we did it and what the um, aggravations and successes were, I'll put it that way. So just a little bit of background, next slide about Humber River, uh, and that is that it was three very old sites, about 250, 300,000 square feet each, came together in the 90s. Uh, in 2007, in 1999, we talked about building a new hospital. In 2007, it was approved. And in 2010, we went out for um, uh, design and build of it. So lesson number one is when you are embarking upon a project, it takes a really long time. Do not be surprised about that, but use that time very wisely to develop what it is you want and to do your pre-planning because I still talk to hospitals now who say, yeah, we're through the build. Can you come and talk to us about efficiency? And I would argue that it's too late by that time. So next slide, what we did find in our design work is that we were moving in to 1.8 million square foot facility. And that in itself is a huge challenge because um, uh, the ministry does not pay you for the square footage growth. Your money in healthcare comes from the volume of work you do. Many hospitals are new with expanded beds and we were fortunate we were. Many are expanded facilities and not necessarily expanded beds. So you may in fact be moving into a much bigger facility with the same amount of money. What you will find is you never have enough. Once you max out and you think about the future, you never, story of healthcare, have enough money. But next slide when you are moving into facilities that are 80 to 85, and perhaps it'll be before long, 100% single patient rooms, you are talking a lot more square footage. Next slide, when you start to build for bariatrics and certain features that are expected in hospitals now, um, and some of the safety features, you really have to look at how you are going to save money and be able to operate that facility. And, and it doesn't come from just architectural design. Single patient rooms, whether you pile them on top of each other, you put them in a circle, a square or a diamond, there is still distance to walk, patients isolated in a room alone, and you need to be able to um, manage that. Remember, 76% um, of what we do in healthcare is we pay for people to walk around. We called that sneaker time. Ministry does not increase your budget when you increase your square footage, and therefore you have to compensate for that. And we spent a great deal of time working on that. So the challenge that we found ourselves faced with was, next slide, how do you deliver enhanced care in a larger facility with more beds, increased patient visits within the same operating budget while creating staff engagement and high patient satisfaction? And believe me, if you're just putting in single patient rooms, you will not have staff engagement and high patient satisfaction because they'll never see each other. So we really had to focus on that. Now, how do you construct, and I'll come back to it, the next slide, and this is the key thing to remember and why the work has to start early. So there's design, build, finance, maintain, and the maintain allows you to have the building maintained over a 30 year period. There's design, build, finance, finance over a period of time, and there is traditional build. In traditional build, all of us who have built in that, um, know that you kept your capital low because the hospital had to contribute about 30% and because the ministry had limited money that they could spend. So what ended up happening when you built cheap is you then spent your money in maintenance, repair, life cycle refurbishment and utilities over time. And that is a traditional build because otherwise we couldn't have afforded to build anything. Next slide, if you go to the DBF or the DBFM value proposition is that because we can spend the money over a period of time, and you know we can argue later whether that's a good idea or not, because the capital and the actual fixed sum of money, all we can afford and raise in a short period of time becomes less of a focus. 
it gives you that opportunity to say, what could I do that decreases my utility and my energy costs, that decreases my maintenance repair over the 30 years, and that decreases my life cycle refurbishment. So whether you're a DBF or a DBFM, um, the life cycle refurbishment might be different, but you have an opportunity to now say, let me spend on the capital to save the other. I will tell you, and uh, you will hear from Lori Pella later, Grace Pan, people that are, are or have been on our team, you know, it's more accepted now, I think, by the ministry that some of these capital expenses are reasonable. In the days when we were designing Humber, I think there were lots of people that thought we had some very strange ideas. Next slide. We did, however, understanding that as a team, and we were a small team, I was the chief operating officer and I led the, the redevelopment team. I had about five key people on that team. We brought others on and we consulted a lot. We had a CEO and a board of directors that were very supportive because we had done a lot of education, a lot of discussion on it. Dr. Ruben Devlin um, was the CEO at the time, really understood that we had one opportunity in our life to solve some of the problems we saw and to have enough operating money that we could move forward um, successfully as uh, building and managing healthcare. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but some of the things that we actually wanted to be able to do was a, ho a hospital that delivers safer, higher quality care at less cost than we had. And some of those things that are key was the process automation, interoperability, a smart building technology to reduce energy consumption and a platform that pulled all of that together. Those were key components. And the next slide, We'll just show you that we had an idea of reducing costs. I'll speak about that later. Reducing FTEs, maintaining nurse patient ratios in spaces two to three times longer, improving quality and safety and patient satisfaction. And today is about green. So not about those elements necessarily, but we came up with, next slide, really a vision element that was lean, green and digital. And I don't can't separate the three of these anymore. And it may seem strange that you wouldn't separate digital and lean from green, but I'll explain why. The energy model in a design, build, finance, maintain, it doesn't matter so much for today's discussions, except that the capital is a piece that you can spend and do it well. Energy consumption is the responsibility of the hospital, uh, the owner, or energy responsibility, sorry, of the operator in the DBFM. The cost of energy is paid by the hospital. Um, the one benefit to the DBFM model is that you can put a pain share gain share in there. And so you won't have that in DBFM. The benefit in the, in the DBF, you won't have that in the DBFM. That is a bit of a benefit to incentivize further work. So we, you know, there's differences between the two, but I still believe the energy model can be done in either. Why did we do this next slide? Showed that, so just click if you will. If we just built the hospital and transferred the energy consumption we had in the energy costs, our energy bill each year would be $5.5 million. Next, click again if you would. If we reduce that by 40%, we could save, um, you know, uh, about um, our energy bill would be 133,000. We could save about $89 million over 30 years. That was very attractive to us. Now, uh, pain share, gain share, and a DBF one's a further incentive. I will tell you, um, and we can flick to the next slide as I'm saying this, when we talked about doing that, um, there were many people who said, are you kidding me? It's impossible. It's a very strange thing to do. Are you really serious? Uh, and we did know the energy performance, and I'll show you the gray bars on this slide, of academic hospitals, you know, 719. The average in Ontario, 753. Community hospital was at 819. The best energy star building was 653. Um, equivalent kilowatt hours per square meter, that's measured in. And Lori Pella and our design compliance team, HOK, truly believed we could drop this to 40%. So you have to have a team that has a lot of trust with each other. You have to have a team that is small and cohesive and willing to work together on this. But I will tell you, and I think, um, you know, Lori will probably confirm if he's speaking later today, that there were times where we sat at the design table with our three um, uh, 
firms that were bidding on our jobs. So we, during the whole design development process, and uh, they said, this is impossible. This is ridiculous. Are you sure? And if any of them are on the phone, they will recall this. And I do remember saying to Lori at one point, Lori, are we really sure we can do this? Because these guys are all saying we can't. Uh, but we were committed to it. And we knew that, you know, if we could save two and a half million dollars a year, transferring that money over to patient care was definitely going to benefit us. And we had many discussions about it. We went back through the model. Um, it's a, it's a, you have to be really an engineering person, I think, to understand the model. But we trusted each other and we were committed to that lean, green and digital. And we brought the digital team in on it as well. So at the end of the day, what was interesting is we spent almost a year with three firms designing what they thought the new Humber River Hospital could look like. And then they had to bid on it for construction costs. And then they needed to look at the operating expenses. Um, and we needed to incentivize people to take our energy performance seriously, because as I said, they looked at us many times like we had three heads. Uh, one of the things we were able to do, next slide, is add, uh, we can just flip to the next slide. Oh, there it is. We actually went back to Infrastructure Ontario and they were very helpful in allowing us to put it, uh, bonus points into the evaluation of the project for those that could meet the sustainable energy innovation. So now we incented design. And I would say that that helped a lot. Um, and I don't, you know, the contractors may never tell us and we, we probably don't know how much it helped, but this stated to them that this was very important to us. 30 of their vision element points were going to be that they had to meet our energy innovation plan. And we did see a real difference in design as a result of having put that in there. And that can be in a DBF, that can be in a DBFM, it can be in either, it is not a challenge. Um, and I would suggest that this uh, way of evaluating your vision elements, particularly um, if in any element, I would say, but certainly in your energy innovation, it is well worth the bonus points being put in there. And it really uh, woke people up and we started to get some really good designs. Um, next slide is just a piece I wanted to say you cannot do without if you are going to continue to manage your energy model. And I will tell you that this is whether you, my belief is this is whether you are a DBF and you're managing your energy model yourself or it's a DBFM and, you're, and your M team, your service co, are managing it. And that is that we had a, uh, a conceptual architectural structure for our um, ICAT that linked our hospital clinical information systems together. So when the operating room was closed down, it wasn't like somebody had to remember and set the system. The operating rooms go down, the energy goes down. The spaces are not occupied, the energy goes down. After hour, I mean, I'm here at seven o'clock at night and the lights all go out, but that's okay. You just, they'll go back on if you just wait a minute. You don't even have to call the light gods because they know you're in the room. These are the things that you need to do. You need to bring your lean, your green and your digital vision elements together and you need to know that in a modern building, if you're going to continue to manage your energy model, you need to be able to establish what your model is, evaluate your model, continue to monitor it and automate it. Because if you don't automate your systems, things will happen that people will forget to do certain things. There's all kinds of features that you can put into ICAT. Once you build an architectural system where you have all of your patient care information, all of your uh, documentation, all of your systems speaking to each other and being able to be monitored. So at the end of the day, we really worked very hard on it. You'll hear more later, but I'll just show you the next slide. We actually did get to 41.8%. So we put the 30 points in there. We had three contractors, all of who initially said, wow, these guys don't know what they're talking about. Um, and, um, and I said to Lori, Lori, are you sure we know what we're talking about? Uh, but at the end of the day, two out of the three came to the table with energy models that got us below 40%. So in fact, the one we chose was at 41.8%. So even lower than we had imagined we could get. And it represented the savings of over $2 million, two and a half million dollars a year. And we are beyond that now because of the pain share, gain share. So it works, but you have to incentivize for design. 
Next slide just talks about all the wonders of why, uh, click the next button, if you will, all of the things that we were able to do as a result of saving the energy. So the impact on the environment, um, all of which has been a really wonderful um, marketing discussion. There's been lots of organizations who have come forward to us that want to uh, donate and all of us need donations to build these facilities to a green environmental, to green roofs, to some of the sustainability issues we put into the building to some of the features we put in, and you will hear about those later in the day. But it happened, I think, because we were truly committed to it and people got us to that model. And we have more than surpassed that. So the next slide talks about what if you're not a DBFM? How can you still get this? So I've talked about it costs more to construct, but you're paying it over time, working with the ministry to ensure that they'll understand that. Um, I've talked about incenting design. So trust your team, create your model, incent design so that people will come to the table with it there. And then if you look at the savings here, and this is uh, you know, a chart that's probably fairly common, um, you may not be able to take the 2.5 million and turn it back into entirely um, operating savings because you will need to hold some out to have somebody monitor and manage your energy. But I would argue if you're a building like us and you save 2.5, you might need 300,000 for that. You've still got 2.2 left over to put to patient care. So establish in a design build finance who's going to monitor it, maintain it, manage it, and allow the operating dollars for that. But your savings will be so great that it is more than a business case. And I think that is why you would do it in a DDFM on top of all the things that are being the right thing to do. And then finally, I'll just say in the next slide that we did receive the 2017 ASHRAE Healthcare Award. And these things are, of course, always valuable, particularly, I think, as the younger generation coming up, who is really focused on protecting the environment and the green environment. And that is the group that are going to be really committed to care. Um, it is a, we also targeted a gold silver and ended up with gold um, being awarded, a lead gold. So we targeted lead silver. We ended up with lead gold, which is a, a great feature as well. Um, we have 100% fresh air in our building, even though we are able to save all of that energy. We have lots of features that we can talk to our staff about uh, that gives them a sense of a healthier, um, cleaner environment they are working in. Did not know anything about COVID-19 in those days, but certainly was a great feature in our building as we, um, as we moved into COVID, having 100% fresh air and no recycled air. So those are the reasons why we did it, the team that was committed to doing it. I will make one final comment, and that is if you have a redevelopment team who's committed in designing your building and has all of these great ideas, at all costs, keep that team together. Our team has been, uh, Lori Pella has moved on to West Park, but our team has been together since 1999. Some of us have worked together. And the one thing that does is you remain committed to your vision. And I believe after five to 10 years of us continuing to monitor and manage that vision, it becomes embedded and then it will carry on quite nicely. But don't close down or switch out your design team after. So Michael and Ian, I think that is about what I had to say on this subject. And I think the slides will be made available to people.